Acts chapter 1 is where we will be this morning as you guys will continue through the book of Acts after I'm gone. And I thought this would be very appropriate as this is a big transition for the disciples um, as the church is being birthed and started an understanding of what that is. And as Cy and Angela moved down here in a few months that uh, they would continue to uh, just speak on what the church was and, and how it happened, and that would encourage you guys in the midst of this transition and encourage you guys to continue to, to be the church, right? Because we know the church is not this building. The church is not any specific denomination. The church is the people. And so I didn't know if you knew this or not, but that means wherever you go, the church is there. You understand that? And so people get on this kick of like, oh, I don't have to be a church to be a, go to church to be a Christian, as in come here to be a fellowship. And I say, yes totally understand what you mean, but the Lord has called us into fellowship, and it is a very unique time that when we have church fellowship here in this building, that we can come together and hear his word, we can come and have accountability, we can come when we've blown it and confess, we can come and lift up others who have maybe going through a situation that you've been through, and we are created for community, we are created for fellowship with God, and in that he has put that innate desire in humanity as well to be, have fellowship. And so that's why we come here, not because it makes you necessarily a, a Christian because you come to church. Wherever you go, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the church is there because you are a believer in Christ. So remember that. Um, that means you can have church, right, while you're taking your tests. That means you can have church while you're playing Frisbee. That means you can have church while you're working. That means you can have church while the boss is yelling at you. You can have church when some crazy driver does something crazy. Um, that doesn't happen in St. Kitts, but other places um, that that happens, we can have church because we are the church right there. All right? So let's just jump in here. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Let me just actually read through verse 11. I think it'll be better. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostle whom, whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together, and with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Last two verses here. And when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you and into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. That's the end. Sorry, I got you. Boom. <laughs> I saw it changing. I was like, is Carlos putting scripture up there? Boom. Um, so Theophilus, first thing we see here, he's like, I'm writing to you a former account made, O Theophilus. What is Luke talking about? Well, Luke is the one who wrote the book of Acts, and he also wrote the Gospel of Luke. And so his former account that he wrote was the Gospel of Luke. And he's writing it for, it seems to be, this guy, Theophilus. Um, so if you can imagine, we have Luke and Acts. Um, they would write on scrolls, and you know the book of Acts would have been roughly about like a 30 to 35 foot scroll, right, to write all of that down. And they didn't have books like we have today. And so even though these are two separate books, they were written as, you know, kind of one volume or at one time, all right? So Luke wrote all of the gospel of Luke, and then there wasn't years or, or, or months or anything that passed. He then continued to write the book of Acts. 
works. So just understand that when we see this, it wasn't like Luke wrote down when the gospel was happening. It was later afterwards, he was the one that interviewed people, most likely interviewing Peter and Mary, and the mother of Jesus. And so he's getting all this insight. Then we see in the book of Acts the same thing. So after the book of Acts had already essentially happened, then he writes it down. So he wrote all this down one time, right? I don't know how long it took him, but it was all at one time. Um, from interviews, except for once we get to about midway through the book of Acts, you'll start hearing him use we. We were there. And so all of a sudden, Luke is actually on the scene, and so that's when he was actually there as an eyewitness to the things that we will see um, in the midst of, uh, uh, that happened in the book of Acts. So who's this guy, Theophilus, you may ask? Well, um, a lot of scholars uh, debate on who this guy is or who this guy was. Some people think that um, he was not actually a real person, but the name Theo is God, right? Ophelous, like lover of God. So his name actually means lover of God. And so some people think that Luke was just writing this in general to a group as in anyone who loved God. Here is the gospel of Jesus, and here is what happened immediately after. And so they don't even think he was a real person. Um, some think that he was... Um, a man who was just a Roman official and wanted to know more about the gospel, more about Jesus, and wanted to know it more correctly. And so he writes this for um, this political figure or this person in Rome. Um, and the one that I like the most and makes the most sense, although we don't know, and so you can't, I can't say thus says the Lord, but this makes the most sense to me, is that he's writing this because it ends with what? It ends with Paul going to Rome and then being in prison, and then it ends. I feel like if you were writing this after that point, you would have probably written what happened to Paul, right? And this was the end, and this is where his bones lay, and all these things. To me, it makes most sense as you read through it that Theophilus was probably some kind of magistrate or someone in the system that he is now, Luke is now writing kind of an appeal to of like, hey, this is the truth of everything. This guy, Paul, that's with you, that is now going to be on trial, that's going to Caesar. Like, I want you to have all the correct information. And essentially, here's the defense of Paul. First off, i got to start with Jesus, though, right? And he starts with Jesus, and he gives him the gospel. And then now he says, and this is everything that happened after Jesus ascended back into heaven. And he was, you know, showing this to give defense. Now, again, um, can we prove that? No, but it makes the most sense of as we read through the book of Acts, you even see Roman officials are always talked about in a good light. You know, they're not, um, and, and, and Luke as well. They're, they're always some kind of respect that's shown, and Luke, you know, he doesn't, you know, um, fudge the story per se, right, to make it fit like what he wants, but he tells it in such a way that it puts them in a good light to gain favor so they can say, listen, this religious thing actually comes out of Judaism, and, you know, Jewish religion is something that you said is okay, that they can have, and that we can do, and so, you know, Christianity is the same thing, so what your Aunt Paul was on trial for is something that Rome has already said is okay, essentially, so Again, can we prove that? No, but I think it makes the most sense as we study scripture, as we study history, and we look in this. Um, who was the book? Uh, who was Luke, you may ask? Uh, we don't really know a lot about Luke either. We see from Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, that he was a physician, a doctor of some sort. We also would assume that he's a Gentile. Why? From his name, Luke um, is a Greek or Gentile name, not um, a Hebrew name. Um, or a Jewish name. And we also know that he was a devoted companion of Paul from Colossians chapter 4 through parts of the book of Acts, um, through Philemon, 2 Timothy, several different places of where Paul mentions him himself. So a little bit, that's a little bit about the, the background. So now, what is he writing about? What is he talking about? He says, of all of Jesus, what he began both to do and to teach. And I love this. Jesus began to do and to teach. He didn't say one thing and do another. He didn't say, hey, obey me because I tell you to, why he go, goes and does something else, right? He was an amazing leader and a lazy man, and he began to teach others because he loved them, and he continued to also do the things that he taught. And what he did, um, you know, through the, the, the book of Luke and through the Gospels, then continued through Acts, right? Through what? Through the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised and said would come. And the book of Acts covers roughly about 30 years, Okay, um, for example, uh, last, last Sunday, I was asked to share at um, an anniversary church out at Old Road, um, uh, Middle Island, 
And we started a kids club there years ago, and we were there for years. And um, Shane is a, a, a person that was part of that. I met him when he was 11 and was out at that kids club. And so we were asked to come out there and share, and just they wanted to also just commend us and all these things. And so we sat there for like an hour as they like said all of these nice things about us. And it was super awkward, you know. Everyone's getting up and like, well, I met Pastor Brandon, and da-da-da-da-da, and they're so awesome and all this. And they're just good, good, you know, and you're just like awkwardly in your seat like, I mean, I appreciate the encouragement, but it's just weird. I don't know if you ever had that, you know. I've never had that. Like, you maybe see it, like, uh, on TV when they, like, you know, um, you know, uh, make someone come up there and are they're, what's the word I'm looking for? They're praising them and doing all these stuff for them, right? I don't know. It's just weird. But nonetheless, as they got sharing, I was just thinking, you know, it, it's funny. When you put it, all the stories that each of them individually had, it's funny I look at it and I see all the mundane and all the other things, you know, of just where you're dealing with life, you know, raising the kids, dealing with this, dealing with car problems, you know, electric and, you know, all, all the stuff that could go wrong and the stuff we have to live our daily life, right? But still doing ministry through that and living for him. But they just got to see like, oh, Brandon was here and he built these swing sets and this team came in and they loved the kids and they did this and it was awesome. And then, well, Brandon did this, and he came in, and all this, and, I, and it's just like, man, you know, like, that is a lot of awesome things, and when you put it that way, it sounds like, like, that's what I do 24-7. I wish that was the case, you know, that my heart was always in the right place, and had a good attitude all the time, right, Shane? It'd be nice if I had a good attitude all the time. I, I really blew it with him last week after we talked about temptation and all those things, man. I totally failed, but anyways, uh, he forgave me, and, and uh, we moved on, but nonetheless, I'm not perfect, and we see in the book of Acts 30 years, and I want you to understand that because it covers 30 years, you're going to see little bits and pieces and miracles and things that God used people to do over a period of 30 years. It wasn't like these things were happening every single day. And maybe they were, but maybe not to these guys, and God is always moving every single day. And so I want us to understand that if we were to write um, something like the book of Acts today, over a 30-year period uh, time period of, of one man, right, or woman, like you could probably actually see some pretty neat and amazing things and think, oh, man, that person was so super spiritual or whatever, and, and, and God was working like no, in no other way like he was back then. But it was over a period of 30 years, right? You understand what I'm getting at? So just, just grasp that because I, I don't like it when people say, we need to be like the book of Acts and we should be doing this and all these things. So, well, yes, there's things we can glean from, but understand again, like Peter and John, or yeah, Peter, John, you know, Paul, all these guys, they still had to eat. They still dealt with horrible things. They still dealt with probably being bored. They still dealt with their own bad attitudes. They still dealt with a camel dying and having to get a new one, and there's not a good camel mechanic around, right? Like, they still dealt with those things that you and I would deal with today. It wasn't just like anywhere they, they walked, they were just like, oh, we need water, miracle, Psh, you know, oh, we need this. Like, no, it didn't happen that way. Same as you and I live, it was the same exact way they live in the sense of being dependent upon Jesus and having to deal with life, the flesh, and their own attitudes. So verses 2 and 3 it says, Until the day in which he was taken up. So after Jesus was taken up. So he began to teach, right? And he continued to do until the very day that he was taken up. Um, back into heaven. And after he, through the Holy Spirit, given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after her sufferings, many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. What I love here is that Jesus began to both do and to teach, and he continued to do these things and teach the apostles what? Through the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is God, and we know that. Holy Spirit is God, and there are three persons, right? But one God, and it's hard for us to understand the Trinity, and I don't think we'll ever completely get it, but what I do know is that Jesus is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not Jesus. Jesus is not the Father. The Father is not Jesus. There are three distinct things that God um, has allowed us to see in this Godhead. And what we're seeing right here is even though Jesus, God himself, was alive here on this earth, he was still dependent upon the Holy Spirit. Isn't that crazy? So if Jesus was dependent upon the Holy Spirit, I think you and I should probably be dependent upon the Holy Spirit, right? Right? I think that's a, a big point for us. We, can't not, we cannot do this on our own. We can't just show up and create and make things of the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We're not above our master. We're not above Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit. And that was going to be a main point as we continue here, and I'll, we'll finish with. 
but he presented himself after this alive with many infallible proofs. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I mean, he appeared to over 500 people at one time. And all of these people, if not, I should say most of these, if not all of them, are probably still alive at this point in time when Luke is interviewing people. I mean, so there's at least 500, then the disciples. I mean, the list continues to go on as he was here for 40 days after he was risen from the dead. That's a long time. If you hung out with someone for 40 days, You'd probably get used to them being around and their quirks and everything else and, and where they're going and who they were. I mean, Jesus was hanging around for 40 days after he rose again, continued to teach and continued to give commands and continued to encourage the people. So many infallible proofs. He, he's saying, hey, he appeared to so many people. It cannot be um, said that he had not risen from the dead. And he continued speaking on the things of the kingdom of God, always about his father's business. Verses 4 and 5, And being assembled together with him, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. First thing, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. He commanded them to wait. I don't know about you, but most people don't like waiting. And any, Anyone here fond of waiting like, you like it, you know, it's like you order the hamburger and then you say, where is it? You know, it's like, yes, I would like a hamburger. Where is it? No, it has to be cooked. You have to wait for it. You know, even at a fast food place. We, we hate waiting. We don't desire to wait and that tests our patience. But when we do wait for something and we, we desire to wait, we're usually saying it's worth the wait, right? Like, I am going to wait for this food because it's worth it. And if you don't think it's worth it, then you will leave the restaurant and go somewhere else where you think it's faster or you'll go home and make your own food, right? I will wait for this girl or this guy because I love them and they need to finish school or just whatever it is that is in life that they're doing, right? Because they're worth it. I want to do that. I want to wait, you know, to be intimate with them until marriage. Why? Because it's worth it because that's what God has said is going to make it healthy and what is right in his eyes. And so it's worth it even though it's difficult and it's hard. I'm going to wait to buy this house and save up enough money. I'm going to wait to do these things. Why? Because I think it's worth it. So the first thing when we see here is that he's saying the Holy Spirit is worth it. So wait. Like wait. Don't leave. Wait in Jerusalem. To wait also means that this promise would come. Jesus is saying, hey, it's worth it. It's worth your wait. And it's also going to happen. I'm not going to leave you with no helper. We saw in John, right? When we studied the book of John, he says, it's to your advantage that I go away so that the helper, the Holy Spirit, can come. And with him, you'll do greater things than I did. I mean, that's, that blows my mind. But it's a promise, and he was going to fulfill his promise. To wait means they must receive it. If you're waiting for your food, you then have to wait there so then you can receive it, right? You don't just, you know, uh, wait there and you wait long enough and then it just, you get so hungry that you create it in your mind and then it just comes onto your plate because you tried hard enough, right? You can yell at the waiter, you can yell at the cook, you can do all that you possibly can to work for it, right? But at the end of the day, it has to be prepared and then you have to just receive it. And that's what the Holy Spirit is. It was prepared for you, and then now you have to wait to receive it. And I think there's so many people and churches that they try to create the Holy Spirit, right, through emotion. Um, you know, they're running up and down the aisle or whatever, and I'm not necessarily against any of these things. So if you're part of a church like this, I'm not speaking bad about it, but if the heart behind it is the same, then I am. But nonetheless, if, I, if you're running around trying to create something by running and, and raising your hands and all that stuff. I raise my hands in worship. That's fine. I'm not saying, again, these are bad, but if you're trying to create emotional experience, like I just got to get up here and I just got to say certain words and I got to do it in a certain way so that then everyone else is just feeling the emotion and we're all sad together or we're all happy together or we're all excited together. No, we don't create. We wait and then receive. And then when God does something and we're a part of it, it's great. Think of it like a, a, a boat, right? We don't create the wind, okay? You hoist the sail, and what do you do? You catch the breeze and the wind that's already there. That's all, that's all we do with the Holy Spirit. And so, guys, don't get caught up in this, and it's okay to be more charismatic. Some of you are less charismatic than others, and what I mean by that is, you know, some of you are a little more emotional, and you like to raise your hands in worship, and you express yourselves in that way, and you give me an amen, and you shout out, and you give me a clap or whatever, and that's great. 
Nothing wrong with that. If you're trying to create an emotion, then we have a problem. If we're trying to create the Holy Spirit, and some of you guys are a little more stoic, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that either. But if God is asking us to move or to be emotional, to be excited or whatever it would be, then we need to wait and we need to receive that. And we need to walk in that. To wait means that they would be tested, right, by waiting. Again, no one really likes to wait. And it's just a test, you know, just kind of, ah, five more minutes. You know, when my clock hits 10, 12, that's all Brandon's getting, you know, then I'm out. You know, that kind of thing. Right? It's hard to wait. It tests our patience. But it was worth it. It was worth it because this was a promise that he was going to, what, give us, to be baptized in the Spirit. And we need the Holy Spirit because Jesus needed it, and so do we. It doesn't matter how good my sermon is. It doesn't matter how good my argument or my logic is. If someone chooses to have a hard heart, there is nothing I could do about that. I mean, I can give the greatest sermon, the greatest proof that Jesus, I could pull God out of my pocket and be like, Bob, there he is, look, a picture of me and Jesus. You missed it, right? Like, but unless someone's heart is then touched by the Holy Spirit and it breaks those chains, then it doesn't really matter. And so we need the Holy Spirit. This church needs the Holy Spirit. You guys need the Holy Spirit. You can't work and do enough things, again, to convince or conjure up something. It has to be God. Are we still called to go and share the gospel? Yes, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we trust as I share, as I trust as the word right now is going out, that the Holy Spirit is softening hearts, causing wheels to turn in your mind, and breaking down walls that the, the word of God would come into your heart and accomplish what he wants it to accomplish. And so we're baptized by the Spirit, and he gives a, I'm not going to get into this, we could talk about this, this is a whole sermon. What does it mean to be baptized by the Spirit? We see in Scripture, he says that there's only one baptism. So, so Brandon, there's two mentioned at least right here. And I could maybe think of another one, you know, the Christian baptism. Which we're saved, you know, getting baptized. So what is this? How is there only one baptism? There's one baptism into the body of Christ, and that's salvation, right? That I am now baptized. What does the word baptized mean? It means to immerse. It comes from the word to immerse. And so they would immerse. Here we see John Baptist, what was he um, preaching? He was preaching repentance. And it was a baptism of repentance. So people would come and then be baptized and immersed in repentance, right? Then it changed the fact that they still had to go out and stop sinning and go out and change their life. But they're coming and saying, I'm repenting. I'm being immersed in repentance. I want to follow God. I want to follow him. And then Jesus comes along and he changes the whole thing, right? He didn't need to be baptized, but he was right, to show us that, hey, I am totally immersed in God because I am God, right? I am totally immersed in dying for you. I'm totally immersed and covered by the Spirit of God, and that's why we saw what? The Holy Spirit came and ascended down like a dove onto Jesus because he was full, wholly immersed by the Holy Spirit, and this is what he's saying for us, guys, just like baptism, water baptism, when you go in and you come back up, how wet are you? Pretty wet, right? I mean, if it's dunking and under coming up, you're completely wet, I would say, depending on how wet the water is. Some water is wetter than others. But nonetheless, there we go, I got you on that one. Nonetheless, we understand that when we are baptized, we are fully immersed, we are totally wet, and it is a picture, all right, of this right here, being baptized in the Spirit of when I have the Holy Spirit, and I'm walking in Him, and He's covering me from head to, toe, head to toe. It's not just a little bit. It's not just partially, right? I want to follow Him wholeheartedly. We can't have one foot in and one foot out. It doesn't work that way. It will not work that way. Uh, verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked Him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, this is an interesting question to me, and I won't spend too much time on it, but this is what they were always constantly wondering. Like, we believe you're the Messiah now. Obviously, you just died and came back from the dead. We'll believe whatever you tell me at this point, right, if, you just, if that, that happened. We know that you're the Messiah. We know the scriptures. We know the prophecy. You fulfilled all of those things. So now when is the time where you... Get Rome out of here and restore the kingdom to Israel. We have no more bondage, and it's just us and you, God, and we're just kind of ruling the world together kind of attitude. That's what they thought. And there's two reasons uh, or two things I would say about this. Number one, I think they're asking this question maybe because they know Jesus is getting ready to leave. I can't prove that, 
But again, what, what prompts this question? Um, maybe they know he's getting ready to leave, or maybe just because it's been 40 days and it's been a while. Like, are we, like, are we training an army? Like, what, what are we doing? You know, are you doing the snap thing, you know, like Thanos? Or what, what's happening? We don't really know. But I'm thinking maybe they kind of gathered he was talking, like, about leaving. I don't know. Could be me. But nonetheless, when will you restore this kingdom to Israel? And how does Jesus answer? He doesn't rebuke them. It's like, oh, my gosh. You guys are idiots. How many times do I have to tell you this is not how it's working out? I'm not a political messiah. There's a bigger picture here. You guys are so selfish. No, he doesn't do that because he's Jesus. And he loves them and he loves us. And what's he say? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all to Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. It is two things here. Number one, he says, listen, you have to trust me because it's not for you to know the time of those things. If he would have told them the time, you know, they, uh, they came in and, and destroyed the temple of Rome in 70 AD, right? And from that point on, Israel essentially has ceased to exist as a nation. Until what? Just, uh, you know, 50 whatever years ago it was that they became a nation. So uh, about 2,000 years, a little less than that, from what you could say of maybe them actually being, they're having their kingdom restored. Maybe not in the way exactly how they wanted it. But can you imagine if they, he would have answered the question like that? He said, hey, you know, when is it? When are we going to happen? He's like, oh, 2,000. 2,000 years from now. Wait, wait, wait. What are, we, what are we talking about, Jesus? 2,000 years you know how many generations that is? That's a lot. Jesus is like my great, 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 great grandkids, you know? And that would might have been discouraging. They might have lost hope. Like, oh, well, I guess I'm going to go back and watch TV. What am I going to do? Wait for 2,000 years? No, he didn't tell them because it wasn't their time to know. And I think sometimes God does that for us, guys. Sometimes he doesn't want to give you all the puzzle pieces because it's not for us to know because if you did know, you'd be discouraged or you would try to take things into your own hand and totally screw it up. And he says it's not for you to know. And this is where trusting God comes in. And if I could just give a little personal example, you know, for us, um, I kind of liken it to these, these puzzle pieces. And I think I've shared this before. I can't remember uh, if on Sunday or not. But it's like these puzzle pieces. Like when the Lord started speaking to us about it's time for us to go, it was just like he was get, kind of giving us this puzzle piece. And I'm just like, you know, all right, what is this? You know, and you're kind of turning it. You're looking at, I don't know, you know, I guess just save it for later. And it's kind of like in my heart, I was like, Lord, this isn't you. Like, you're not telling us to leave. And then what happens? Another puzzle piece comes. Another puzzle piece. Another puzzle piece. And then all of a sudden, you start putting them to, to, together. And you don't have this whole picture. You just have this eye or a nose. <laughs> you know, you have no idea what else is out here. But out of this 5,000-piece puzzle, you got an eye. And you're like, all right, Lord. I know this is an eye. I know that you're calling us to go. I know you're preparing and you've answered in these ways. But what about the other 400,990 pieces, right? How is that going to work? Where are we going to go? How is this going to work? Who's going to come down here? You know, how are we going to be able to provide and, and, and deal with all this stuff in the transition time? Like, where are we going to live? I mean, the list goes on and on, right? And the Lord just slowly over time, so he, just, he just gives little puzzle pieces, and I love it when he gives you the edge pieces. Because when you get an edge, right, and then you can start framing things out, right? And you put the edges together, and you can say, this is how big it is. This, is. this is what I got. And then he starts giving you more, and then all of a sudden, oh, man, this eye wasn't a human eye. It was a cat eye, you know? And then now you're starting to, oh, these are flowers over here. And, and you're starting to get a picture of even though I'm still missing right now, uh, you know, a couple thousand pieces, <laughs> you know, of our 5,000-piece puzzle, I, I still got a pretty good picture of what it looks like and what, it, what it's going to be. You know what I mean? And there's things that could change, and still I have nothing over here in this left corner. There's still nothing, and it could be a sun. It could be a moon. It could be a car. It could be whatever. But I got this other pieces, and hopefully you're, you're, you're trekking with me, is that sometimes it's just not good for us to know exactly what's going to happen. It doesn't grow us in our faith. And sometimes if he were to tell us exactly what was happened, we would take it into our own hands or we would mess it up. And so we have to trust, just as they did. Hey, listen, it's not time to know. 2,000 years from now, something's going to happen. It's going to be awesome. You're going to become a nation again. Some people are going to like it. Some people aren't. And there's still wars about that, right? And it's going to be until the end. And we see that through Scripture. But then he focuses on something else. But hey, but you shall receive power through the Holy Spirit, and you shall be a witness 
a witness to me. And I love this. Like, don't focus so much on getting all of the puzzle together. Brandon, when am I going to get that man? When am I going to get that woman? When, when am I going to get married? When is this going to happen? When am I going to get this job? When is, you know, uh, my, when, how, how am I going to pay my student loans off? How is this going to work out? How is my, my, my grandma or my, you know, father or whatever, you know, they're sick. How, how is this going to work out? I'm, I'm ans- Lord, I want these prayers answered, and I, I want to know, and I want to see it. Listen, like, we may not get all those puzzle pieces, and you're just going to have to trust that it's for a reason and a purpose, because God wants to trust you to trust him, right, not in necessarily what he's doing. You understand the difference? He wants to trust him as a person, not in what he is doing. Because sometimes what God is doing is going to change. But who he is never changes. And so you need to trust him as a person. My kids, I want them to trust me as a dad. I want them to trust uh, my wife as their mom. Because we won't always be perfect and we won't always make the right decisions. So what we're going to do will be constantly changing. Hopefully it will be good decisions, but sometimes it may not be. But if they can trust us and see that we love them, that even when we don't make the right choices for them, they know that we love them, that we care them, because it's not based on what I do for them, it's based on who I am, right? And that's how it is with God. Not, he won't mess up our lives for sure. Sometimes we think he has, because he hasn't given us something we wanted or he gave us something we didn't want. But we have to trust him because he wants us to trust him from who he is and that he has the greater good of everything and he sees the whole two million puzzle piece of our life from end to beginning, right? And then the infinite puzzle of the world and the universe, right? I mean, you get the point. You get the picture. And he tells them you're going to be witnesses. And what does it mean to be a witness? Well, simply you witness something. I witness Jesus dying on the cross. I witness the gospel, and now I want to share it out. And I want to share it, and I want to go tell everyone about it. And I was a witness to these things. To where? Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria? That sounds like a really bad idea. Jerusalem is where he was executed. Judah, they rejected his ministry. Jesus' ministry in particular. And Samaria was regarded as a wasteland of a bunch of, you know, muggles, uh, half, half-bloods or whatever you call those in Harry Potter world, something. Right? They were like half-breeds. They're not Jews. They're not Gentiles. They're like, eh. That's what they were seen as. And so as we start to close up here, verses 9 through 11, and this is my favorite part. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So that cloud, you know, is like the Shekinah glory of God. I don't know if it was an actual, like, white cloud that came down, right? But probably the glory of God, as we see through the Old Testament and through the Scripture. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, he went up. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, um, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken from you in, into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So he was, he was taken up out of their sight. And I, I love this because it's like, listen, I, I know I died and now I came back, but I want you to see me like I'm, I'm gone this time for good. Right? I want you to see me go. There's none of this disappearing in rooms and out of rooms that we saw in the Gospels. Like I'm, I'm leaving, the glory is surrounding me. And I am gone, like going, going like the balloon, right? I can't see it. Do you still see Jesus? Oh, I think, but I don't know. It's really difficult. It's just a speck in my eye. You know, oh, that's a bird. No, they want, he wanted them to see that he was gone, and they watched. I mean, imagine, like, I don't even, how would you even respond to that? This dude, like, the Messiah came, he died on the cross, he rose again, and then now he's flying on a cloud, going away. You know, I think you'd just kind of be speechless. Like, what else could you say? You'd just be like, kind of look at Peter, like, you know, like, I don't know what would you say. Like, that, that was crazy. Like, you think he's going to come back? Like, should we wait for our cloud, you know what I mean, to go on him? Like, I, I don't know. Like, so even though we want to kind of make fun of the disciples and all those things, like, imagine yourself being there. You probably would have acted in a very similar way, right, trying to figure this out, what was going on. And then... The angels come, and this is, what I, this is what I love, and this is really my charge for you guys as I leave here and as you guys continue at CCF, and for those of you who will leave if you're students um, in the months or years to come, um, this is really my charge to you and my question, right? Why do you stand gazing up into heaven? It's like, go. Go. You have a purpose, 
be the church. Go and live your life for God wherever it is that God has called you to do as he starts giving you puzzle pieces. Like, don't just stand up there. It's kind of like, you know, how, how, how long, you know, were they looking? It doesn't really say. I mean, was it 30 seconds? Was it a minute? Was it two hours? Did they camp out there for, like, you know, the month? And we were just, like, waiting, like, yeah, maybe he's going to come back. Everybody, you know, whose turn is it to watch the sky tonight? And so these angels finally come up and show up and are just like, hey, what are you doing? Why are you just gazing into heaven? Jesus, right, he came and was taken up from you to heaven and will, some co- uh, uh, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And, and he's basically telling them, like, listen, get your eyes off of what just happened because now you have a mission. You have a mission to go and share Jesus. Things are going to be different. Uh, my grandma passed away last week, and uh, last Sunday I recorded a little service for her because um, I couldn't kind of be there um, and, and share with them. And the, and the thing that I, that I came to is when we talked about in John chapter 14 is, if you remember, Jesus dropped two bombs on the disciples, right? And he said, one, I'm leaving, and two, one of you is going to betray me. Right? You guys remember that there at the Passover meal? It says, I'm leaving and one of you is going to betray me. And then, you know, right after that in, in John 14, 1, we see that they're troubled. And that their, their minds are troubled and they're asking these questions and Jesus encourages them. He doesn't rebuke them. He comes alongside and he encourages them. And what spoke to me was just like, you know what? There's going to be change. There's going to be change with my grandma being gone for the family. And, but guess what? Change is, is, is a part of life. And even though there was change for Jesus, and that's when he went on to talk about the Holy Spirit coming in chapter 14 and 16. He says, but it's going to be a good thing in the sense of that because God wants to do something maybe new or a little bit different. And that's okay. And so even though with me leaving, the change is going to be tough or the transition may be tough, guess what? It's okay that God is still with you. Don't just be looking to the past. Don't just be looking, uh, you know, where's Brendan? There he, there's his plane. Bye, Brendan. And then someone finds you just still staring into the sky like a nimcompoo, you know? Like, what are you doing, you know? Like, you have life. Like, live it. Like, I would just happen to be a little piece of this life, right? And I've heard so many times of, you know, oh, Brandon, I, you know, just can't find a church like CCF or whatever because people go home or they leave or, or, or whatever it is that they do, whatever, when they call it off the island. And, you know, it's like, I, I get that. And, and I get that this was a special time for you, and I don't want to negate that. And it's a privilege to serve you guys and to be your pastor. It's a privilege. But listen, like, just because, you know, it's not like CCF somewhere else doesn't mean that God is not working and moving in it. Doesn't mean that he wants to do something new on this new side of the puzzle that you weren't ready for, but now you are. Right? That you started coming to church to get and now you grew here for however long you were here. And then now the Lord wants to go and pour you out somewhere. I say, now I want to use you. Now I want you to lead this Bible study. I want you to step up. I want you to go. Stop staring into the sky. Stop staring at CCF. will never be the same. Again, I appreciate the love. I appreciate the encouragement. But don't just get stuck there. Or I will come down and be like, what are you doing? Get your eyes off yourself and I'll smack you a few times. And I'll get back on my plane and leave again. Go, you are the church. The world needs our thereness. They don't necessarily just need, the disciples are asking these questions, you know, when are you going to restore the kingdom? They, they wanted more information. They thought what they needed was more information. Lord, give us more information about what's next. Give us more pieces of the puzzle. Tell me, you know, who we're going to marry. Tell me what this is going to work out and how, where this job, where am I going to go to school? Like all of this stuff. And the Lord's like, listen, it's just not time right now. What you, what, you don't need more information. What you need is the power of the Holy Spirit, right? That's why that's he told him to wait from the very beginning. Wait for the Holy Spirit. It's going to come upon you in power. And it's going to be amazing because with him, it's, it's, you're going to do greater things than I did. It's to your advantage that I go away and that the Holy Spirit comes and comes upon you in power. So, guys, that's what you and I need. So when you go and, and the Lord takes you another place or whatever and it's just different and all this, it's like, okay, that's fine. But what you need is the power of the Holy Spirit just to guide and cover your life wherever you go. That you choose to walk in the Spirit through the Word of God and the power of the Word of God. And so make that your prayer. Make that the church's prayer during this season. Lord, fill us with your Spirit every day. Help us walk in your Spirit every day. We can't do it without you. 
That's not, we can't do this without Brandon. Uh Uh-uh. We can't do it without the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter who is up here. You need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. We don't need more information or even some kind of new information. We need simply just the Holy Spirit. And how does this Holy Spirit come? Well, it's holy. So you need to understand this. For the Holy Spirit to come inside of you or to be immersed in the Holy Spirit, you have to be holy. Oh, wait a second, Brandon. What do you mean? What do I got to do? Well, first, you give me your credit card information. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) You are made holy by what? One way. And me as well. By the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Right? When you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that he died on the cross for your sins, and rose again the third day, conquering death, taking on your sin, so you can have his righteousness, have his perfection, you can what? Now stand holy before God. And then now as you are now a holy vessel before God, even though we still live in this fleshly body and still make mistakes, but God views you as holy, he will then what? Seek to pour out his Holy Spirit upon you. So number one, you've got to know Jesus Christ. And number two, you have to wait and ask for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does come and live inside of you. As soon as you are saved, we see that through Scripture. But here, through Acts 1.8, it gives us an interesting picture that the Holy Spirit also comes upon you in power. Right? He comes upon us in power. And in Ephesians, we see that we need to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be being filled is actually the, the text. Be being filled, continually. I have the Holy Spirit it's inside of me. It's sealed me for the day of redemption when Jesus does come back or I die. But then also, I need to continue to be filled with it. Why? For the power to walk in the things that he's called me to walk in. To walk in those unknowns where I have no puzzle piece, where I'm just trying to figure things out and live by faith and take care of my kids and deal with my own attitude adjustments, but yet still serve him and love him and be a light and salt of this earth, right? We are called to be a light in and salt. So don't just be satisfied with being salt. Don't just be satisfied with being a light. Most people in this room, I would assume, are a light, as in you know Jesus as your Savior. So you don't come to church to be a light. There's a wordy light here. You go to the darkness, right? And you be the church somewhere else. So don't just stand gazing. Go out and be there. Go out and be the church. Go out and seasoned, season the unseasoned, Right? Go out there and and be a light, and that may look different. That doesn't mean that you're just blasting people over the head with the Bible. But that means, what did Jesus say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? The second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Guys, just love people. That doesn't mean we water down sin. That doesn't mean we don't call sin, sin. Doesn't mean we partake in what they are doing if it is sin. But we can still love people. We can still love them to the utmost when they need something. You don't just say, well, well, that's what you get because you know you got drunk and you did this, idiot. I'm not sharing the gospel with you. No. They may be an idiot, but guys, guess what? They need Jesus, and you're the light. Go and love them. Bless them. Bless them in ways that they don't even deserve it. Why? Because you've been blessed in ways that you don't deserve by God's grace. And as that happens, hopefully conversation comes up. And hopefully, you know, time comes where you can pray with them and you can share Jesus with them and share why you are like you are and be that light to them. So again, you guys don't need new information. You need the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon you. You don't need another person like Brandon here at CCF. You just need the power of the Holy Spirit and the church. And as that happens, that's going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be a new chapter. It'll be transition. It'll be difficult. It'll be tough, just like it was for the disciples with Jesus being gone. But guess what? They eventually got over it, and they continued to go out, so much so that every single one of them, barring John, the church history would tell us that they died for their faith in Jesus Christ. So I heard this the other day on a YouTube video that I was watching, and I really liked it. And this is my, my, my charge to you as you guys go, all right, and, and be the church and just be there, is this. It's the whole church the whole gospel, the whole world, right? That's what you need to be about. Your life should be about kingdom investment. I don't care if you're going to be a vet, a doctor, you already have a job, you're just a mom, you're a dad, whatever it is that you feel is like a a main focus for you of your life, everything should be kingdom investment. Everything. Because you are the church wherever you go, wherever you go. It doesn't mean that you don't want to make 
uh, that you can't make money or that you can't have things of the world in certain ways. But it means that your focus is always on the gospel first and Jesus and what he wants and following him and allowing him to guide you no matter what. So don't be satisfied in just existing, but living a life of adventure and being on a mission for Jesus and his kingdom.